Good morning, folks. A razor-bladed edge on the bearings today, an untoward truth staged to descend upon professors of nonsense. This is going to be fun. We're starting with our star at spaceweathernews.com, and we find the last day on the sun was mostly quiet, even if she did break up into M-class solar flare range. It's a story of hoarding on our star, as at the moment the only semblance of flare power we've seen is that small, impulsive M-class event from the northern sunspots. The horde is in the potential to fire major X-class solar flares from multiple sunspot groups and the utter refusal to do so. Lucky us. With the rise into M-class range, however, even this slow one can't sleep on the sun just yet. Instead, let's put down a brace of balderdash. First is a magnificent stellar environment they say is caused by two stars coming close, hugging one another, and basically sharing one atmosphere, causing a nova-like explosion. Of course, they say the two stars couldn't possibly be resolved that far away, and so they're literally guessing on nearly every aspect of their conclusions, but hey, at least they've got top-notch artists. The second in the pair studied an active galactic nucleus nine billion light years away. They say the X-ray dark spots, the cavities, are telling them that what they're actually seeing is two supermassive black holes in a close dance. Seem like a stretch? Even more so in their radio image, which seems to show the jets and the plane only, no other central object, and they even have the hubris to tell us how far apart the two orbit one another. No, folks. They don't see those two stars or these two galactic cores. The amount of astronomy that is guessing is unquestionably depressing. But rays of hope shine through. The discovery of the arm breaks in the galaxy is an expected feature as they have to contend with the galactic current sheet as well. In terms of the magnetic field component of the sheet, they're starting to realize that they need to nix everything that doesn't fit the observations and instead focus on the radial magnetic field of the galaxy for your visual aid. That would be the threaded fields through the rippling sheet, just like the interplanetary magnetic fields of the sun ripple and thread through the solar system current sheet. Many of you have heard of the Radcliffe Wave, the most famous of the eight or nine small-scale individual ripples they've discovered in our galaxy. Well here, they're showing it's not a lone wolf. It's part of a much larger and more extended system that pervades the galaxy. And here, you can tell this is one of the teams still hoping to explain the ripple in the galactic sheet with a dwarf galaxy collision. And perhaps you might also recall, while we strongly disagree with that causation, it actually does not matter what causes the ripple. Just the fact that it hits our star as it radially flows outward like the galactic version of the Enlil Spiral. Folks, let's go ahead and share this website content from the June solstice. This was a private members video at suspiciousobservers.org, but why don't we all close up shop today like this instead of with wind maps and shots of our star to close. Hope you enjoy. Hey folks, we have been going over the galactic current sheet a lot, bit by bit as it comes in. And recently we got a few more bits of information, but there was a common question asked in the comment section of the video. We can quickly go over now the galactic sheet in detail here, the stats, and give the best possible answer to that common question. Despite showing up in theory, models and observations of polarization and gamma rays, it was not until 2018 that we got a good view of the nearby galactic current sheet effect from the galaxy on the local stars. Many thought that it was a perturbation from a gravitational interaction with the dwarf galaxy, but that idea was debunked earlier this year, leaving most mainstream scientists without a solid explanation for these galactic waves. There are some who think it is a result of galactic spin, which is technically correct, but it has more to do with magnetism than the space-time bunching they think it does. They have no problem openly discussing this wave and how it is tens of light years across, or how it presents a 10% density change from within the sheet to the voids between the sheets, or how its amplitude ranges from 60 to 170 parsecs above and below the galactic plane, about 200 to 550 light years. Now, of course, with the smaller amplitude waves being more towards the interior, this also makes us realize that the tens of light years across is pretty relative. That bunching up at the exterior does shorten that wavelength, but the waves slow down in relative factors to maintain the waveform timeline, or the frequency, at any given point. So it's a 10% density change in a waveform that stretches 200 to 550 light years tall and is about tens of light years wide. It's a pretty large range, but it's lucky we even get this kind of information at all. Now the common question was how fast is this waveform traveling outward in the galaxy? 
Of course, the funny answer is, fast enough to get here every 12,000 years. But let's take the range of 10 to 100 light years, because we don't know what they mean by tens of light years wide, and that's probably as best as we can do. And then we can ask, how fast would the galactic sheet have to be going to hit those distance markers every 12,000 years? The answer is between 500,000 miles per hour, which is slower than the solar wind, to 5 million miles per hour, which is the expected CME speed in a solar super flare. It is very fair to say that this is the outward speed of this sheet in order to have a 12,000 year frequency between those ranges, and most likely somewhere near the low to middle range of that wider range on the screen. That's about as fast as a strong coronal hole stream. I hope that helps with the visual and the stats on the current sheet. I'll see you in the morning. Be safe, everyone.